Well, warm greetings to everyone and God bless you all. Today, we're going to be looking at the issues of military coups, forces and effects of military coups, and what makes it possible to have a military coup. I think it was General Babangida that was saying the other day that um, the military watches the tone of the nation before they decide to strike and have a coup. And if certain things are not in place in a nation, then it's easier to have a coup. Well, we're looking at the coup, especially with what happened in the in uh, the Niger. And uh, also, since we have a very great person as our guest, uh, General Ishola Williams, he'll be giving us a big background to himself, his thoughts and thinking on Nigeria, the history of Nigeria and the development of Nigeria and what the future holds, not just for Nigeria, but for Africa. I'll be inviting uh, Pastor Sonny to direct the affairs of this particular session. And uh, I wish everyone very, very well. General Williams, you are most welcome, sir. And it's good to see you. You're looking well. Uh, Nigeria must be treating you very, very well. So we'd just like you to give us a little bit of introduction to yourself, your background, what you did in the military, your thoughts and your thinking about Nigeria and um, the issues that has gone on in the Republic of Niger. God bless you, sir. You are most welcome to the African Leadership Group, the Nigerian Leadership Series. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Um... Thank you. It's uh, very interesting that um, a group of people had got together to come up and discuss this topic. We, it's um, very timely, really, and especially when Nigeria, uh, the leader of ECOWAS, is supposed to be taking the lead. And this is an opportunity for civil society organizations and individuals to be able to contribute. I have um, sent some, I sent some, some few words to Madame Dumoke about who I am. And I don't think I want to say more than that. Okay. Please go ahead, sir. What's your okay. thinking about Nigeria, the state of affairs in Nigeria, uh, a little bit about the effect of coups in Nigeria, and what's your thoughts about this recent coup in Niger and what it portends for Africa and the African continent? And Sonny, you can take over from here, please. Thank you. Thank you. When we talk about coups in Africa, especially in West Africa, we are going back to the 1960s. And for example, the case of Nigeria, 1966. Since that time, many coups have happened. Everybody at that time was worried and various programs were set in motion with the military in mind to prevent further coups and uh, if oh, all of us can remember, in the, in the our 90s, all these schools stopped. So we had a respite. When you then talk about Niger, <laughs> Niger is one of the countries that have been having a series of coups. And I have an experience with Niger when in in 2010, we had to go there, 2009 and 2010, to go there because the military head of state at that time, even though he was elected, Konetanja, wanted to extend, extend his stay in power after two terms. And he got a group of people as usual to change the constitution. 
And that led to a lot of, you know, Ruhaha in Niger, and they had to call in ECOWAS to find a way to help solve the problem between the opposition parties and the colonel there, who was the president. Interestingly, the present president, Bazoum, was the leader of the opposition party at that time. Because the, the real leader, who later became the president, Isupu, was on exile. So he took over from uh, Isufu and became the leader of the opposition. They negotiated the transition to power. Now, that transition came to an end in 2010. And can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. We can I hear you, please go ahead, sir. Oh, okay, yes. So that sanction came out, <laughs> ended when there was a coup d'etat in 2009. Echo was sent General Baka there, and General Baka managed to com convince the military boys at that time to set a one year transition program. And by 2011, they had had elections and then handed over power to the civilian government. That was the one that brought in the media past president, President Isufu, okay, and made Bazoum, who did a good job really during the negotiation to be the foreign minister and later the minister of interior. Now, Bazoum was chosen by Yusufu to replace him. If people, some people can remember that, after the election last year, and Bazoum was to be sworn in as the president, the military attempted the coup d'etat to stop the inauguration. People did not take notice of that at all. It was Yusufu himself who managed to come in the military and say, oh, let this guy take over. But the military was saying that the election was rigged <laughs> and, and so on. Well, we but they managed to resolve you. that. And this is our man. Thank you. OK, Bazoum became president. Since that okay. time, the relationship between the military and Bazoum has not been very smooth. Not been very smooth at all. Now, what Bazoum thought was that he should not bother his very head very much about the military. Once he has support from another state, like you know, they have a base there with about 1,000 soldiers, and from France, which also has a base and has been there for some time now, and increase the number of personnel in that base, when they were sent out of Mali, with about 1,500 people. And those meetings are very, very important in the war against the jihadists. Very, very, very important. Okay. And since Mali told everybody to back up and started to bring in the Russians, everybody moved to Niger. And a lot of millions of dollars and euros has been spent by European Union, France in particular, Damnia and so on, and in other states, of course, having a drone base in that place. So, I'm going to mute everyone. General, please hold on. Mute can, can you please mute everyone? And yes. Sir, can you please unmute yourself? Please. Sir, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, so it was very comfortable. Believing that, you know, 
Even though the military did not like him, there was nothing they could do. France and United States could save him. But he forgot that France has already made up his mind that if there had going to be any coup in any part of Africa, in the past 20 years, they were not going to intervene, except they were, to, they were called in to intervene. Now, that is very, very important. Why? Because France was urging our president to intervene. And if you look at it properly, you will see that France wants to use Nigeria as a proxy <laughs> to be able to force the military boys to bring back the civilian president. Fortunately for us now, our president had backed down and is not talking about diplomacy, especially since XM of Kanu, Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, went on quiet diplomacy, which ought to have been the first step. Instead of all the noise, you don't negotiate by threatening people. You don't. And that was what was done. Okay, so at the end of the day, Sanishi has come back. From what I've heard from the Buddha, our president has toned down his, his voice with respect to force and is now open to diplomacy. And I think uh, Sanusi Lamido Sanusi has opened the, um, the door now for quiet diplomacy. Let me also say to that uh, we Africans need to think seriously. And what do we need to think about? If we have France and United States in Niger, what it shows is that we are dependent on outsiders to help us fight the jihadists. And to appear that without them, because even Mali that sent out France and every other person, Mali has to go and go, had to go to Russia, and Russia sent him Wagner. Something's wrong with us, sincerely. And we need to sit down really and find out the way. The second thing I want to say is this. ECOWAS is always using the same playbook. What do I mean by playbook? Whenever there's a coup, who, they will rush a group of people there. They come and talk to the major boys. They will apply sanction. They will do this, they will do that. The same playbook. The, 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 the Nigerian officers have understood that. <laughs> and they, they knew what ECOWAS was going to do. So they were ready. OK, they were ready. But because ECOWAS does not seem to have learned from the lessons from Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea. Because if they have learned their lessons, they're going to ap approach the Nigerian situation with the way they did. They would have approached that way at all. Again, um, when the boys were taken over, especially the presidential guard commander, who was appointed by the middle class president. When they said they were taking over, the man who appointed him, the former president, wanted to talk to the general. The general listened to him, but he said he was not, was not backing down. But Echo has never bothered to contact President Yusuf to ask him and say, what's happening over there? What's happening over there? They just threatened and said, oh, we are going to use force. If we don't change within one week and so on. Secondly, there are some diplomatic efforts you make. You don't publicize it. Nobody knew that Sanusi was going to, to Niger. He went and succeeded. We are United States. ECOWAS and other people did not succeed. He saw the military head of state. He saw that. So it is always very important that you don't apply the same playbook to every situation. Give yourself some time to say, is this situation the same with the last one? If it is not, what can be done? 
Now, let me quickly move to what effect will it have? Now, <laughs> of course, I well known in Africa, and especially in West Africa now, we are used to it. We have four already, and everybody's going about their business. We are so much concerned because the Western countries are very much concerned about what they call democracy. That's a much concern. But the point is this is that there's a question mark here. And the question mark is this is that if democracy is so good, why is it that the military is always taken over? It's so good. Are we really applying it well? Because if you look at the governance system, we copy that in the United States or France. And what you discover is this is that African presidents are semi gods. I'm telling you, they are so powerful. African presidents are semi gods. And in no way are they modest about their powers. And in a multi ethnic group, we need to start looking at other models of governance in Africa. Because to a certain extent, too, what has happened in the case of Niger, too, is also to to a certain extent, the ethnic group that Bazoum belongs to, which is a minority, minority, minority group altogether. And the ministry believes that the, minor, the minority belongs to are part of the jihadist movement and the rebel movement. And therefore, it's not allowing them to deal with, with the jihadists and the echo violence that is going on in the Sahel. But frankly, there is nothing that the military boys can do to be able to change the situation. Because they haven't got the capability, they have not also got the capacity. So if our day have here, the best thing for them is to beg France and other states and say, don't interfere, but help us with what you are doing with fighting the jihadists. If not, the jihadists should take over. It's taking Nigeria 10 years to be able to eliminate Boko Haram and Iswap. 10 years, more than 10 years right now. And we don't know when it's going to end. We don't know. Okay. And we have a multinational force with Chad, Niger, and Cameroon. Okay. So to me, we need to sit down within ourselves as Africans and find out the so-called so African solution to African problems. But we don't, we, we lack strategic thinkers in Africa. Very much so, we lack strategic thinkers. And at the rate we are going, I can't see any change. Now, finally, let me say something now. When you look at Asia, for example, Asia hasn't got Asian Union, like the African Union. They haven't got anything like that, but they have regional groups. Now, there are coups in, uh, in Asia, but not many. The case of Myanmar comes to mind. In Thailand, the military is in charge of governance. And you cannot become a prime minister without the military. In Pakistan, they've just jailed the former prime minister and banned him from public office. So in some countries, the military are so powerful in Asia, okay? And the Western countries have accepted that. They've accepted that. It's only the case of Africa that they continue to push and push and push and push for the democracy. We Africans on our own side too, we have not sincerely looked at what is all this is about democracy. And is there any way we can sincerely look at the way we apply democracy here, especially elections, especially elections, because the Niger people too said the election was rigged, that the election was rigged. Therefore, we, we need to look at, people have come up with various systems, rank voting system and so on, 
we they use in New York, for example, and some parts of the United States. Okay. That eliminates some sort of political party system with the rank voting. Okay. So these are some of the issues that I want to raise. Let me stop here so that people want to contribute or who know more than I know, they can also say what they know they can learn from you or all of us can learn from you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, General. Um, thanks once again for that very insightful comment. Um, my name is Sonny. I'm a co-host also with Pastor Itua. Um, it's interesting listening to you. I want to find out from you as a man that we learned um, walked out of the army because of a military coup that was staged in Nigeria, that would presuppose that you don't think that the military should be in government. But listening to you now, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you will seem to be suggesting that democracy is not entirely working for us in Africa. And so the Asian model should be looked at maybe, or you know, uh, the Arab models, because you spoke about China, um, Pakistan, and some of those places. Do you are you suggesting that we should have a blend of something like that? Given that you yourself were so obtuse about democracy in the early days. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Did you hear me? Sir? Okay. Now, um, some of us who are old enough, we remember our first president of the ceremonial, Dr. Nandi Azikwe. Yes. He said one thing when the coup happened in 1966. He said the future of governance in Africa for some time to come is Dayaki. Does anyone remember any person remember that? Idayaki. I can't remember that, but go ahead. <laughs> he used the word Idayaki. In fact, that's the first time I've heard that in my life, but that's about 50, 50 years ago now. Okay? Yeah. But people forgot about that because in the real sense of it, there's nothing like a military government. None. It's impossible. You must always have civilians serving with the military boys, like the case of Niger now, they've appointed a prime minister, a civilian. They've appointed a cabinet of 21 people. Only six of them are military officers. Only six, the rest 15 are civilians with four women. Okay, so there's not really like that. And again, people tend to forget one thing also. The civil service or the civil servant they are the engine of governance. If they want to sabotage the government, they can do it easily. In fact, the, the civil servants run government. Civil servants run government. So it's not a matter of blending, it's a matter of hierarchy. Now, what really happens in human existence is this is that after some time, we will get to a stage in we will be like the United States or France or UK or anything like that. And the military will not even think about who the time. When Trump was sitting around the United States and asked the military government to take over, the military to take over after the election of Biden, the chairman of Joint Chief of Staff just said no. Just said no. And it has happened in Nigeria too during the time of President Azikwe after the first elections in Nigeria, in which he called the, the commander of the army and said the election was rigged. We should take over. Okay. All right. So um, it, to be clear, you don't mind a daiki for us in Africa. Yes. Oh, because thanks. after some time, after some time, the whole thing will normalize itself. Yeah, but we've been on this journey from the 60s when we had 
incessant military coups in most of Africa. And we thought that we have ridden that wave and now we are in a flowing democracy. Do you think the alternative to continuous bad government and perpetuation of those in leadership, whether in one political party or the other, is the intervention of the military? Is there no other way we can do this other than having that, military intervention? Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. You know, when the military takes over, you know one thing they always talk about? Corruption. Yes. Yes. They talk about corruption. Yes. Day to day they get there, they become crooks. Yes. Okay. Yes. But when you look at when you look at the financial system of government yes. and the parliamentary system of government, in the parliamentary system, in the presidential system of government, the president, like I said, is semi-god. Because when you look at many African countries or even our own Nigeria, the, the, the president is supposed to be you know, checked by the judiciary and the National Assembly. But we know, like uh, what Miller said when he was the Speaker of the House, he said they didn't elect me to come and oppose Buhari. He was told, we are not telling you to oppose him. But you are just to go, you just, just not pass any bill at all that he brings without questioning. But if he's doing something that needed to be changed, then we needed to do it. Okay. So, and in, in, in a country where there are man, you need a parliamentary system of government. Let me tell you why. In terms of accountability, there are three levels of accountability in the, in the parliamentary system. Number one, you have your constituency. It's your constituency that chooses you within the political party. So in the parliamentary system, the political party is very strong. Okay. Secondly, when you are elected and you go to the parliament, you're also accountable as a member of the parliament. Okay. Now, if you become the prime minister, you are accountable to the, to the parliament in which you have to go to the parliament every two weeks or every, every, every month to go and give account of your stewardship. And if they know that you are messing around, they will tell you to leave. In the presidential system, they are even afraid to call, a president will stay in Nigeria for eight years without giving account to the listen. It's only recently they put in the constitution what they call, you know, presidential speech or something like that, once a year, that you come and give account of it. No, that sort of system is not suitable for our country. And what we also forget is this, is that our talent in Africa is followership. It is followership, it's not leadership. Leaders don't drop from heaven. Leaders come from followers who are chosen by followers to lead them, okay? And there's no leader without the follower. So if followers don't like you, they kick you out. But our followership system in Africa is so weak. It's so weak. And now it has been taken over by money. But in the parliamentary system, at least to a certain extent, it is checked. It is checked. And that's the what sort sort of thing that I see, that I believe that is good for Africa, where they have a parliamentary system of government, not the one that they have the president, and the president is powerful and he chooses the prime minister. No. No. So we need to do some serious thinking in Africa about our governance system, and like I was saying, even about voting. There's a new system of voting they call rank voting in which at the end of the day, the person that's elected is not elected on political party basis. It is because that person has the character that the voters like. That's why they voted him in. Because at the level of the rank voting, they've forgotten about the political parties. No. They've forgotten. And when you look at presidential system too, the president is also the leader of the, of the party. So who can talk to him? Who can talk to him? So 
And that, that is why the military becomes the opposition party in African countries. They become the opposition party. Okay. All, all right. So explain that ranked voting again. What? How does the ranked voting work? We'll come to you, uh, those that want to ask questions or those that want to contribute. You spoke about ranked voting. How does that work? Uh -huh. Okay. Very good question. The ranked voting, what it does is this is that uh, after you've gone through the primary in your party, okay, in a country where they allow independent candidates, they will pull all the independent candidates and the political parties together and tell people, forget about the political party they belong to. Look at the individual, okay? And if you think it's good enough, vote for him. So they will all, people will vote for all the candidates. The first two candidates, we now go for the election. Okay. All right. All right. The first two candidates we now go for the election, irrespective of any party they belong to. So okay. you then find a situation in which money bars cannot dominate anything. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Um, let's just drill down on the Niger coup a bit. And I know you've given a bit of history and background and um, the ethnic group that Bazoum belongs to and even President uh, um, Yusufu before him. Um, the issue is the coup has happened now. And um, we know that the EU went, they were rebuffed. A few emissaries went from Nigeria, they were rebuffed. Even the Americans went, the EU. But eventually, Sanusi was able to get audience with uh, the coup leader, General Tiani. Um, what did you think that achieved? Uh, when he came back, he went to the villa, he briefed the president. And today we hear that the president is talking about um, um, a more diplomatic option, a more diplomatic way of resolving the issue. Where do we go from here? A coup is on ground. Do we give them time? Do we extend it? Do they put more sanctions on the country? Where do we go from here? <laughs> Good question, sir. <laughs> now, I want to take you again yes, to sir. the past. Yes, sir. In 2020, yes, sir. when Jonathan went to Mali, the Malians were behaving exactly like this in the year when he went there. So Ecuador applied sanction. So the Malian boys, military boys said, Mr. President, we will not talk to you except they leave sanctions. Yeah. So Echo has now told the Malian boys, appoint a prime minister and set up a cabinet. So Mali appointed a civilian president and set up a cabinet of ministers. Just like Niger has done now. I know what Echo has did. Echo has lifted the sanction. Ecuador nature the sanction over Mali. In the case of Burkina Faso, when the young captain removed the senior from the presidency, Ecowas went there and spoke to the young captain. And the young captain told them that there is no going back. But Equus can be assured that you work at the transition program. Nobody knows the transition program up to today. Equus has not said anything. Okay. In the case of Guinea, Guinea sent told the president of Equus then, Embalo of Guinea Bissau, who is also a retired general but now president of uh, Guinea-Bissau. They told him not to come back there again. I'm telling you, that's what they told him. They abused him in Guinea. Nobody has been able to do anything about Guinea. Nobody. Therefore, all these examples that are given now, Yes. what 
Niger has done now is what Mali has done to get sanctions removed. Set up a cabinet and the civilian prime minister, Dayaki. Dayaki. And so like you said correctly, yes, sir. give them some time. Give but, them sir, some time. If, if we continue in that trajectory, what's the wider implication for the West African country and by extension, other African countries? What stops this from happening in Benin, in Ghana, in Sierra Leone, in Gambia, in Nigeria, you know, and um, everybody buys the time. And then we'll be back to the 60s where cool was the order of the day. As far as I see it, the Ghana Armed Forces will not do a coup. They won't. No, no. So I'm just giving an example that if um, what you are suggesting is that people can just do a coup and get away with it. Um, yeah, Mali has done it. Guinea did it. Um, the Burkina Faso did it. And um, in the last four years, there have been seven coups in the region. Three succeeded and they are right now in power. Another four probably did not succeed very well. The issue is what can the ECOWAS heads of state really do? What can we do? And I understand that you have said a daiki may be the way to go and that um, the antidote to coup is good governance. Um, and we are not having that currently in Africa. So are we saying that the option to bad government really is military intervention. <laughs> do we have do we have an alternative? Yeah, the because, balance. Because if you look at the opposition parties in Africa, they are not strong at all. They are not. They are not strong at all. And because we follow the presidential system, political parties are weak in presidential system. But in parliamentary system, political parties are very strong. Because in a parliamentary system, the opposition party is the party in waiting for power. Party in waiting. In parliamentary system, in presidential system, there's no party waiting for power. Secondly, two in presidential system, it is too personified. It is too personified, but not in parliamentary system. So what I'm trying to say this is that if you want to present, prevent many coups in Africa, we need to look at this semi-godlike presidential system that you have, a system of accountability that you have, and how we can develop opposition parties in Africa, which presently we do not have. Okay. Um, I'm not sure everybody on the platform will agree with you, but um... I would like to open it up a bit. I still have more questions so that we can interact um, because it's very, your, your perspective is very interesting and uh, we would like to look at it. We in the African Leadership Group, what we are trying to push was really to get citizens' engagement in holding leadership accountable. And we are proposing to do this by several factors and ways because I think the real challenge, and you mentioned it, was that we have very weak followership who do not challenge leadership, who do not hold leadership accountable. For instance, the Senate president said on live television, while Nigerians are crying under the weight of a policy that their government have pushed down our throats, that fellow senators, the clerk has sent something to you to go and enjoy your recess. They are going for more than a month recess, no work, they're going to collect pay. And on top of that, they've sent something to them. Now, we, the citizens, how should we ordinarily react to such a thing? Should we demand full accountability, full disclosure of what was sent? Can we see the account of these honorable senators? So what we're trying to do is an empowered citizenship, an empowered followers that can demand. And if it doesn't happen, we'll take it to the next level. But, you know, so that is what we're trying to do um, with this group that we have. But it's interesting that you have said that, look, um, the only people that can probably hold this strong dictatorial kind of precedence to account in Nigeria 
will be the military. Um, situation in point is the military comes in and then the military and the civilians become padis in hand and they begin to oppress because in, in, in reality, most of the people that have entered politics retired from military and they went into politics. They were no different. So the, 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 the issue with that, like I think, and you may respond to it if you like, is that a diarchy will still produce the same result we are having now. But if we have an empowered citizenship and empowered citizens that can demand accountability, know their right, stand on it and do not budge until the right thing is done, then we'll probably be able to begin to make progress with democracy. I don't know what you think about that, sir, before I open the floor up for, for questions. You, you see, what I can say is this is that for the past um, one and a half years, yes, sir. I've been looking for any institution at all, whether it's the church or you know, university or anything like that. Yes, sir. To set up a lab for followership. And how followership can be empowered. Yes. So if you send me more, if you send me your email. Yes, sir. I will, I will, I will, I will send you the concept paper. Great. Sonny, I, I have a question to ask a general. Okay, Just go ahead. One question. Yes, sir. Uh, General, sir, you were part of the military. And there was a coup, there was not a coup. Can you take us back as to what the situation was then and why you actually then left the military? And uh, what do you think we can do in Nigeria to have good governance? And then, Sonny, please take over from there. So I just want you to give us that throwback, sir. What happened at that time? Why did you leave the military? And going forward with Nigeria, what do we need to do to ensure we have good governance? Thank you. No, no. But see, there's something we need to, to understand about uh, a regional organization is as powerful as its members. Any regional organization is as powerful as its members. Here we have ECOWAS and ECOWAS, there are some member countries of ECOWAS who do not even pay for the past 10 years. We have not paid their contribution for the past 10 years. Nigeria has been paying. And not only that, ECOWAS is not yet what I would call a confederation in which states have given up most of their sovereignty. But ECOWAS is moving towards that, like in case of Switzerland, for example, in the case of Switzerland. But what you do find also is this is that most institutions in Africa, in fact, including our own civil servant in Nigeria, they don't like anybody to come up with ideas from outside. They don't, very rarely. But they come, they will like the Western countries or even Russia or anybody to come up with the ideas. Actually, if they are going to back those ideas with money. And therefore, unlike European Union, where they even found NGOs to produce ideas, to produce innovations and things like that, that does not happen in Africa. Because those organizations too are dependent on getting something for Africa. To a certain extent now, ECOWAS is uh, getting 75% of its funding to run ECOWAS, not for projects, from member countries. And Nigeria, as you know, is paying about 60% uh, of that amount of money. Okay. Having said that, I think Pastor Eto has said what is necessary for us to do. Empowerment of the citizen all over Africa will change Africa completely. Africa's problem is not leadership. Africa's problem is followership. We've got to accept that. It's not leadership. Secondly, too, 
we push too much on human rights, but we forget that human rights and human responsibilities are two sides of the same coin. You cannot ask for rights if you are irresponsible. You cannot. But we, because the Western countries come and say, human rights, human rights, what about your responsibility as a citizen, as a person? That's part of the empowerment. That's what it's all about. OK. All right. Thank you very much. Um, there, are some, there are some different thoughts, and um, it's good to engage with you. Um, you're a man that has been on both sides of the divide, and um, you obviously have your servant. So if you want to ask a question, some people's hands we are up X, Y, but it's down now. So the way we do it, we open it up for some comments and questions. I will take Remy, Shobutu, and um, um, Itemitari, and Frederick. Um, those three um, in that order. So Remy, if you can unmute yourself, um, please go straight to the point. And um, if it's a question, ask, if it's a comment, make. Yes, I'll do that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah. When we look at um, the, um, the nature of the problems that come up with governance in Africa, yes, Africans are not operating in isolation of the rest of the world. And so I believe that African nations are actually playing in a very intricate web that has been woven by the West in particular so that they have their hands on resources at lower than market rates perennially. And because of this, they've built their structures so that they manage the problems that arise from the leadership in Africa, whether it's good leadership or bad leadership, to a point where they benefit from such things as coups, from such things as uh, 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 corrupt leadership and so on and so forth. Now for Nigeria, I believe personally that we've come a long way. And because we've come a long way, we are able to influence to an extent the West African nations. Let's even start from West Africa. And I believe that certain institutions in Nigeria should be um, allowed to feed the leadership with, as we as um, the general earlier mentioned on, the production of ideas that would help leadership take decisions that would not put uh, organizations such as ECOWAS in jeopardy. Because the West all uh, ideally wants to see such um, um, organizations fail. Now, I don't know what the status of play is, with organizations in the past that had responsibilities for, for the production of ideas. The National Institute of, um, the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, we don't know what's going on with that. Oh, right. yeah, that. <laughs> Hello? Hey. Hello? Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Um, uh, in the past, there were also several think tanks that had the responsibility of just, you know, looking at scenarios emerge uh, in the subcontinent. And I know that if we were a little more efficient at playing this game, not only being overt in our, in our, you know, in our uh, production of ideas, but also being covert through our embassies in these nations, through business contacts, through uh, uh, former leadership contacts and so on and so forth, the present leadership would have had a slew of ideas or options to at play before they had approached the ECOWAS with this option of a military intervention. It wouldn't be the first thing, as the general had said, thrown on the table. Yeah. Um, so we do need, we do need, we do need um, some kind of structure, intelligent structure that allows uh, the presidency drill down into these minds that are supposed to be fully engaged in looking at the scenarios, preempting the actions of the West even before, you know, months before they actually take, uh, actually uh, take a step in action. So that we are able to, to ad, ad, identify to ourselves what our response will be. It just shows how cold, we were left out in the cold, you know, in, in this Niger coup. And the, uh, the, Nigerians, the, the Nigerians are our brothers, really. We've had centuries of, of uh, interaction with them. So there's no reason why we would not have some kind of um, uh, uh, channels of communication that tell us this is about to happen. What is Nigeria's uh, um, what is Nigeria's position? So that we are able 
to determine what our position is, regardless of what the West wants to do, and that we come out ahead and we're not at loggerheads um, or are able to prevent things happening, you know, uh, you know in the states that are, that are around us, the contiguous states around us. Regarding fellowship, there's another organization called the National Orientation um, <laughs> organization or whatever it is you know these these organizations collect billions in budget uh, allocations every year well, the output is zero so i'd like to know from the general he seems to have a much broader uh, perspective as to how all these things play uh, so that we are able to be in a position where we are we are uh, a step ahead if possible or in step with the west uh, regarding what their own selfish motives are for having coups where they want to have coups uh, and so on and so forth in West Africa and, uh, and beyond on the African continent. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, General, I hope you noted that. Um, we'll just take one more, two more comments. Okay. One from A. Timmy, um, and then the other from Frederick. Then I will come back to the other people. Please, let's be brief so that more people can have opportunity to throw in their questions. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Good evening. General, sir. Uh, my question is directed at you, sir, General. And I'm asking, what are your thoughts about the risk of having a president who, at least in this instance that we have seen, he appears to be acting like a foreign asset or proxy to the extent that he rushed to want to use ECOWAS to declare war on Niger, basically against any conceivable interest of Nigeria or the Nigerian people and for the interest of a foreign power. So I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that, sir. Okay, thank you for that question. The general will answer. Frederick, unmute yourself, yeah? Frederick. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll go straight to the question. Yes. What is happening in Nigeria, in Nigeria today is 50 times worse than what is happening in the Nigerian Republic. The general said that when that the problem is with the followers, to some extent, I agree. But the issue is that when the followers protest against bad governance, unarmed citizens are shot to death, not injured, shot to death, and in some cases, given mass burials. Then the same government will tell you, if you want a change of government, do it legitimately through the ballot box. We go for elections, they rig elections, impose themselves into office, and they tell you, go to court. You go to court, they try to manipulate the judiciary. Then when you plan coup, they tell you, oh, coup is not good. In a situation like this, what should the followers do? That's question number one. Secondly, and finally, sir, I don't know the role of the African unity, the, the African Union in Nigeria, in the Africa of today. We have at least 13 foreign countries having military bases in Africa. US alone has 750 military bases across 18 nations. Now, these military bases in Africa, they exploit the minerals, they still, I, I like to use direct where they steal the minerals of the people, they sponsor coup. And I know by perception that the rebel anti-coup group that just came out of Niger Republic now is being sponsored by uh, the so-called foreign powers. What there is no, I don't know of any African country that has military bases in US, China, uh, and those countries. What are what is it that the African Union is seeing when they accept these foreign um, troops to have bases in their countries? Is it not selling our sovereignties? That is just the question. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just to give the general, um, so that the questions don't become too much. For, general, I'll allow you to take this first three um, and then we'll go on to the rest. So if you raise your hand, just keep it up because if it goes down, then you will not be on the chat. So okay. yeah, go ahead, sir. Now, um, so the comment from the first uh, gentleman, I've been 
I've been running an NGO down for the past 25 years since I left the military. That's what I've been doing all my life. And I can tell you, sir, I've approached many ministries, many institutions under the government, trying to push ideas and things like that. What they are concerned about is money, not ideas. They want you to bring the ideas and to bring the money. Whereas they have budget. And what did they do with the budget? The budget disappeared. Okay. Let me just give you a simple example. Uh, Sheikh Gumi says that the Fulanese are doing what they are doing because nobody's looking after their health, their education, and so on. I've asked Sheikh Gumi so many times. And those have come across in government, including the Sultan of Sokoto. What is the job of the Nomadic Commission? The budget they get every year, what do they use the money for? The Nomadic Commission, because I came across them in the 90s after I retired from the army in a Kali village in Yobe on the border with Niger, the Niger Republic where they were tending to nomadic Fulani children. They move with them as teachers, health workers, and so on. Why did they stop? Nobody has been able to answer that question. Up to today, nobody. Now, you could see that the whole issue about Fulani something has died down. Tim Buhari left. That's how the idea works, so, you see? So, even if you have a wonderful idea, the civil servants are not ready to listen to you, except you are ready to share the money with them, or that's if they even bring out the money. Or, and even if you get money from somewhere. The second thing I want to say is also do that. ISS, DSS, they have an issue for security studies. They have one. Every one of security agencies they have a research unit or such institute. I've been asking them, what do you do? When you go to them and say, let us do a conference or let us do a brainstorming session by Zoom. I remember I went to one and I told them that I will set up the Zoom platform, just like this one. Let us do some brainstorming. Oh, they said, no, 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 we want a physical meeting. Go and bring the budget. And I said, I'm not going to bring the budget. Then he said, it will not happen. <laughs> it just will not happen. And that's it. And there are no independent think tanks in Nigeria because most Nigerians who have some money, <laughs> they don't want to do that. So that's the, that's the point about ideas coming into government and things like that. And the last point I want to make on that thing is that if you look at the Western world, People move around from academic to government to think tanks. They rotate like that. They rotate like that. So you work in the think tank, you are invited to work in government, and then you end up later in the academia to share your knowledge about what you have seen in government. It doesn't happen in Nigeria. So that's what, to Madam, I, <laughs> Madam, let us accept one thing. African presidents don't want to look good in their own country, they don't care. As long as they look good with Western world, they're happy. So if there's anything to do, they needed to do for the Western world to say, yes, these are good men, they are very happy. Whatever you think about them internally, it's not their business because most African presidents lack what I would call legitimacy. They are elected legally, but like uh, the last like I said, the legitimacy is not there. Legitimacy is not there. 
so whether it's prodigy or no prodigy, as long as they look good. And that's why France jumped up and said, oh, Nigeria, go in, we'll support you. Go in, support you. They're not talking about uh, Boko Haram. They're not talking about Boko Haram at all, or what's happening in the Sahel. And also, too, the former rebel group, group in Yé has come up and said they are ready to fight the military regime, that they're ready to fight. So if France is looking for people to support, they said France should support them to be able, able to overthrow the military. Who is going to die? The Niger Nigerians. So that's the unfortunate thing. But really, do that sort of thing happen in Asia? This is what I was saying. Really, it happens in Asia. Now, about uh, the other question. Now, let me just say that the empowerment of citizens and so on and so forth start with citizens accepting responsibility. Okay, In accepting responsibility. And when they go out to accept responsibility, it means that they will not be dissuaded by money. The answers that happened in Lagos, for what I saw in Lagos, <laughs> they interviewed some few boys on television. The boy said that uh, he goes there because he gets three, three meals a day. That's what he said. Get this meals a day. And of course, people were getting money from abroad to, to be able to keep the protest going. All right? So it, it wasn't a spontaneous, voluntary something. It was not at all. That was why the whole thing collapsed. And that was why the government could get away with whatever, you see, they were, they were trying to, they, they, they did with that answer. And to today, nobody knows the whole story. Because the Lagos State Government has refused to release the report of the Board of Inquiry that was set up. And the lady, Justice, who did it, was very bold. And I'm sure in the report, she said so many things that the government will not allow us to see. So <laughs> what? At the end of the day. So really, 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 where we need to start from is this. In the 1960s, in the 50s and 60s, members of a political party used to contribute money to political parties. And therefore, not a single person can dominate the party. Today, members look for what they can get from the party, not what they can contribute to the party. And if you have a situation like that, of course, when PDP, the money that presidential candidate was, was depositing to be able to contest in millions of naira, they were sharing it. They were giving themselves millions. As members of the executive committee of PDP, we don't know what happened in the case of APC. <laughs> so, followership is still very important. We can't run away from it. The, because once scholarship are empowered, the people who become leaders come from that empowered fellowship, okay? And they know that for where they are coming from, accountability will be demanded from them. That is what is happening in the United States with Trump. That's what's happening in the United States with Trump, okay? You've got to be accountable. You got to be accountable. Citizens will demand for it. You got to be accountable. And that's what we lack in, in Nigeria. Finally, about all the institutions that you have set up in Nigeria, I am telling you 90% of the DGs are just there to look for money and make money. And because there's, Nigeria is one country that has the greatest intolerance for impunity. Get this intolerance for impunity. I'm just uh, trying to I've set up a framework in which, but after I can start doing something we call impunity index. Again, we've got the concept paper on that. 
the Triple Eight Index. And I was talking to Center for Democracy and Development. If they can help us with some money to be able to start getting up that index, the Nigerians will see that we are one of the greatest countries with great tolerance for impunity. And in any country where you have impunity, I'm telling you, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way you can have men and women of character. Where in the world would you have a president who have no classmates in primary and secondary school? Where? Let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um, let's take the next set of questions. So I have um, Olufun Shofa from Ayokunle, Pagbemi, Tunde Apolegu. Um, I will take those three or maybe four, add Christine. Then I'll come to Auntie Adelike Grinch and others. So, um, yeah, go ahead and ask your question, Olufunke. Okay. Olufun Shofa. Uh, well, Please, let's be much, brief yeah. so that we can throw in yeah, more right. um, interaction. First of all, sir, I think uh, uh, the, the general has spoken a lot about followership. I just want to, to underscore the fact that at least in Africa and Nigeria in particular, the so-called followership has been popularized and it's illiterate. In fact, in the last mm -hmm. eight years, you can see that poverty was weaponized. So when people are poor and illiterate, they are not stakeholders anymore. They've been marginalized. The whole process has been hijacked. That's it. So that's something I want you to remember, sir. Then the diarchy, I remember that Zig spoke about it. I was alive and well at the time. But the, that concept in itself, soldiers are not angels. And that's why when they're coming, things do not get any better. And finally, the last points I want to make, sir, is that governance and poor and, poor, and, and, and the lack of progress in the entire continent of Africa is related to what we've adopted this so quote, quote unquote democracy. Voting is not democracy. And we have not in any way looked into context of historical, cultural background to adapt it. I'm not sanguine about the future because unless we have so, something like a, a, a sovereign national conference where we decide about the best way forward, we will never, never, this system we are operating, whether presidential or parliamentary, it empowers just a few. And, and that, is, that, that, that is my concern. In Yoruba culture, we used to have governance by consensus. Even though there are kings, they have a governing council. And then, so people, you get the idea of input from even ordinary people. Until we do something like that, as China was not, was not, did not allow itself to be bulldozed into a concept of democracy, it did what is best for it, and it is where it is today. So unless we do something like that in Africa, and I'm not too optimistic about that, and really look at a cultural, historical background and adapt this concept of democracy to suit us, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your comments. Um, okay, let's get um, Ayokule. General, good evening. Thank you very much for your presentation. It is clear that we belong to the same school of thought that says we need to develop our own indigenous governance system by reviewing issues clearly and objectively in a manner that will allow us to harness the interest of all stakeholders. So it's not just about diarchy in terms of the military, we still have the roles that the cultural and traditional leaders and rulers are expected to play with those in the religious parlance. And I want to thank you for bringing this to the table. Specifically on Niger, I was hoping that you will help us to again discuss the Sahelo Saharan conflict system, particularly as it relates to the notion and dynamics of neo eugenics and neo Islam, particularly in terms of the intra Islamic contestations, which played out in terms of the attitudinal disposition of the incumbent military regime in Niger to the official emissaries led by General Abdusalam Abubakar, accompanied by his eminent Sultan 
of Sokoto Sahad Abubakar. But audience was given to the 14th Emir of Kano, who incidentally is a Khalifa of Tijani, sect of the Islam. I am hoping that you will throw a little bit more light so that it can help us to understand the nature, character of Islamic contestations and the terror networking and their implications for the West African region. I thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll take one more. General, I hope there are not too many. No, it's okay. Okay, we'll take one more. I think we have uh, Tunde Apelagun. Thank you, Mr. Sonny and Ebi. Yes, sir. I have the general said that Nigeria yeah. is... I, I had the general when he was speaking. He said Nigeria is, 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 is being used by France as a proxy. I don't really think so because there's no evidence that Tunubu is acting for France. And uh, we shouldn't be making statements that we cannot collaborate with evidences. That's number one. And I believe that the nature of our people in Nigeria uh, doesn't embrace integrity properly. Because no matter how bad the system that we use in Nigeria, whether presidential or uh, parliamentarian system of government, if the people operating it are very honest uh, with, uh, with high integrity, uh, including accountability and uh, you know, submitting to argument and allowing themselves to be criticized without taking those who criticize them as enemies, I think Nigeria will be better. Thank you. Thank you, um, Pastor wow. Sonny. Oh, okay. Sir, do you want to address those three questions? Good evening, sir. Yes. Thank you so much for doing this. Maybe you can yes. take those and then we'll take the next set. Yes. Okay, but the one... <laughs> the uh, one uh, General, please, okay. there's one thing I want to say again. We need, mm -hmm. to, we need to assume that those were the Boko Haram people, when they have come to when they come to Nigeria in the north to perform their terrorist uh, operations, wh wherever they run to, it's very close to Niger. So people who uh, plan the coup in Niger might be the terrorists that we need to deal with. So we shouldn't be blaming those who uh, the ECOWAS who are coming together to deal with the terrorists, because, uh, like you said, there's, there shouldn't be a military government. Thank you. Yeah, let, let, let me start with that. The statement you have made is not true. I, I wish I have a way to pass on your statement to the, to the military government in Niger so that they can sue you. <laughs> because I'm telling you, they are suffering in Niger. They are really suffering in Niger. Just like the people in Lekka too are suffering. Okay, so that statement, I, I doubt it, what I do too. Now, again, about this project, no proxy. So the whole world, when fans came up and they were insisting, were insisting that let ECOWAS use force and they were ready to back up ECOWAS. Okay, and got Senegal to say, yes, if you go in, if Nigeria goes in, which will you come? <laughs> Senegal, how will Senegal come? They have to fly about two and a half hours from their camp or from their business to come and join Nigerian troops. It's about seven hours from Sokoto to Niami. Seven hours. At a particular time, Young people join the army to be mounting roadblocks from the border up to the army, trapping every damn vehicle and so on. So, <laughs> to me, why should France be insisting? Why? It was because the statement made by our president encouraged France to say, yes, it is true. Let's invade Niger. 
And once you make that sort of statement, you sound like a proxy. Now you are backed up after the visit of a Islamist, and this Islamist is missing. We bring you to the point about this Islamic something. See, there's one thing that um, we need to appreciate about the Islamic world. And that, that's what they call Umar, the Umar Brotherhood. In the real Umar of the Islamic world, there's no territory as such. It's a global Umar. And which means that if a brother Muslim approaches another brother Muslim, they must find a way to reconcile. Now, what is important is this is that the Emir of Kano, like you said, is a caliph. It depends on the sect that Jani, the Jani in here belongs to. So if it's the same sect with Sanusi, who is the caliph, he has no alternative but to listen to him as a Muslim. The second thing is this is that I don't think Tiani is a it's an outside trap. It must either be Kanuri or one other type. Because the person who took Sanusi to, to the military head of state, the heir of Dangara, okay, is a Kanuri, sort of. All right, so Tiani may be a Kanuri person. <laughs> and these Kanuri people are the ones who are manning. Boko Haram and Co. So you then need to ask yourself, we need to ask ourselves a question. If Boko Haram are mainly Kanuris, I've asked many of the, some of the traditional rulers have come across. How come that you cannot solve the problem of Boko Haram if they are mostly Kanuris? What is the issue? Why are they not listening to you anymore? Why are you so helpless? And you are, you are both a spiritual and traditional ruler. Okay. So, at least to a certain extent now, Sansi Lamedo Sanusi being a caliph, and they respect the caliph, I succeeded in doing what the others could not do. But you must remember one thing too. And this was one thing that one has been telling the was It's not every time that you send the delegation that you have to make an announcement. Who cares? Find a way to solve the problem. After you have solved the problem, publicize it. But before the end, quiet diplomacy. And that was what Sanusi did. And that's what he should have done right from the world go, instead of threatening. Because that's what France and Co wanted. So that's why I'm saying that it's a proxy. And like the Madame too said, same story. And it's obvious to anybody in Africa. African leaders want to look good before the Western world, before their own people, compared to their own people. They want to look very good, that's all. Now, about <laughs> the system of government or governance, like China. No, China is not the, if you look at the Nordic countries, for example, Sweden, Finland, and so on, it's a dream world. If you've been to, at least I've been to Norway and Sweden. And I met Nigerians here who told me that, no, this is a dream world. If you're familiar with their system, they're on parliamentary system in all these countries. But it's a dream world. And one of the countries, Finland, is where EPA is. Who is telling people to sit at home and not go to work on Mondays in Finland? And the Finnish government said, free speech. Okay, we have no evidence that is causing you know, violence in Nigeria and so on. So they still allow him to stay there. So it's not only China, and I can tell you one thing, sir. From the experience of uh, Russia or Soviet Union, China is going to implode one day, except China changes, and create and establish a system like Switzerland, which is what non Chinese people in China are asking for. That's what they're asking for. In fact, in the case of Nigeria, if we adopt a confederal system 
all these national conference and this and that will go away. Once you have a computer system in Nigeria, it will go away because most of the things that needed to be done will be done by the state, not the federal government. The federal government will just restrict itself to three or three, two or three items. And that's all. That's why in Switzerland, nobody knows the president of Switzerland, nobody. If I ask what's the name of the president of Switzerland, you don't know, or any minister in Switzerland. You don't know them because the power belongs to the people in the canton. And if the federal government is going to pass anything that concerns everybody, that's a referendum. So there are systems of government, there are systems of government that we can adapt without holding any national conference. Erufai, Erufai made a report. What has happened to the report by Erufai? For APC. What happened to the report? In which Erufai went as far as resource control, which I body is scared of. He went there. The, our president has never spoken about the uh, Erufai report or about the issue of devolution of powers for a true federalism. He has not made a single word about that because he doesn't want it to happen. And our governors too, do not want it to happen. Because what people do not <laughs> realize is this is that Nigeria concentrates on the federal government. They forgot their own state, they forgot their own local government. So state governors and local government chairman, they can steal as much as they want. Our, even our media, they don't even talk about that level of government. They only talk about that level of government. And there's no governor who will tell you that he has left that position and he's not a multimillionaire. See the pension they are getting in the poor site. Like you say, we are poor. But see the pension that the governors are getting. Having a house in Abuja, having a house in Lagos, getting so, so many hundred thousand every month. Free, key, free car, free, the, oh, no, no, no. That is why followership in a country where there are serious followership, that sort of thing never happen. That sort of thing never happen. In some countries, parliamentarians don't get paid. They get allowances when they meet. Akwabio said he's giving people talking. That talking is two million naira, and he's talking, Akwabi. The first thing they did was to collect 75 billion to buy cars and everything for themselves. No, it is weak followership. It is weak followership that's allowing all these things to happen. That's all, not national conference or anything like that. We know what to do. Even the president said knows what to do, but I didn't know what to do. He deliberately did not want to do it. And the way we are going, Malatinubutu may not do it. Thank you, sir. Um, do you, should, we can take the next set of questions now, sir. And so uh, we'll go ahead with uh, Professor Grange. And then for La, we have seven hands up. Uh, we'll take those. Those are all the hands we'll be taking today. And then some questions from the chat. So go ahead, Ma, with your question. Thank you very much. I'm okay. Thank you, Pastor. And thank you, General. Um, my question, which actually, there is one question and a comment. Let me start with a comment. There is actually nowhere in the world where you have democracy uh, running smoothly, not in the developed or in the developing world, but it's worse in our own situation because at the grassroots level, the uh, mode of governance of various communities is that of autocracy. Look at all the um, tribes, ethnic groups, etc. You find that their leaders, even in the villages, are mostly men. Occasionally, um, an accident happens and a woman is put as the head. But that woman has to be very, very tough and um, to survive. And most times, she do actually does not survive, except in history. So, um, why is it important to look at this? It's because that is where we have evolved from. And that's why we are finding it very difficult to, uh, to develop a democracy. 
in the developing in the developed world the it's taking them years to get to where they are now and even now they're still having problems but um their followership has become um so motivated activated and educated that they are now claiming their rights that's where we want to get to in nigeria but we cannot get there if we continue to have um, inequity in the in governance inequity in the communities inequity in governance um, the senate congress etc they are all ruled by men the, um, the president is a man from i don't know i mean various they they actually do have some form of looking at ethnicity and and um, demographics etc but they have not yet come to looking at gender and i think that is something that needs to be looked at so any government either presidential or or um what is the other one they or well, any know. any one of them that can give us uh, better representation will be the one that we should be aiming at or aiming for and you can see that the uh, the nordic countries have actually arrived at this women have become their presidents and they've had to be equally accountable you know so they are becoming um sort of gender blind and ethnicity blind and whatever and that's where we want to get to okay having said that my specific question is this concerning this nigerian situation um does ecowas have a constitution that actually prescribes um what to do in the case of having in the case a coup occurs in any of their countries or does the constitution actually help them to prevent coups this is something that needs to be looked at again and we are so used to you know okay those developing constitutions without um, due reference to uh history uh you know demo, um, demographic problems etc that once the constitution is even developed we set it aside and we don't even look at it again so um general please can you address that issue of the constitution of thank ecowas you. thank you thank you, you ma'am thank you very much ma'am and we are going to ask uh for la plan engineer from canada and uh, Mr. Charles Odion Iyure to ask their questions. We, because we are coming up on time, please keep your comments and question very brief. Thank you so much. Go ahead, uh, Fola. Thank you for the um, very important uh, Zoom gathering today. I appreciate the speech of uh, the general, and I've learned a lot. I'm so sorry, it's noisy here. I'm going to change my position. We, we can lot, hear you. So that is helpful, very helpful to the inside politics um, of uh, Niger. The question I have is with respect to the gruesome um, French neocolonialism, whereby, according to um, Dr. Arikana, I think she's from uh, Zambia or Zimbabwe, who analyzed the struggle they're having to shed the neocolonial power of France over their currency, over their central bank, over uranium, and so on. So if what she said is uh, true, um, and that can be verified, I think they need help. 
and it's only the military that can shake off the hands of France. My only fear is that that framework may not exist whereby they will be supported, their currency will be supported. The ECHO, the West African currency was to be introduced about five years ago by the economic community that has made a lot of strides. But it was the French countries that prevented the introduction of that currency because France was having a stranglehold on their central bank. So they need sympathy, they need help. So I wish ECOWAS could understand that. Uh, the question of being proxy to France is wrong and uh, we should be careful when we are making comments. There is a protocol, there is a constitution of ECOWAS. There is a protocol, when there is a coup, you must condemn it, you must sanction them and you must make them aware that force could be used. It, there are a series of uh, 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 protocols that are in place already. So whether it is the president of uh, Benin Republic that is the head of ECOWAS, he will follow that steps, those steps. But we all know that all conflicts and wars end up on the round table. That is why I'm in favor of pressure and uh, 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 coupled with uh, diplomatic uh, uh, moves that will help them to resolve the problem. Thank you. So thank you, sir. So you did, there was no question, really just the comment, correct? Okay. So um, we would have Chelsea. Chelsea Yuri, please go ahead with your question. Okay. Um, thank you very much, the General. I thought, uh, I think it's a very um, thought provoking presentation. But I like to look at the bottom of it all, to what Ramesh Beto said earlier on, that all of this really is an idea to get arbitrage on commodities and keep people perennially poor where others are on the other side. Politics in itself is about producing shared prosperity. If there is no shared prosperity, the basis of politics ceases to exist. That is where I disagree with the general and the fact that his policy fellowship is a thought. Because politics in itself, or governance in itself, is the aggregation of individual rights into a representative and responsible bureaucracy, be it a monarchy, be it anything at all. So it is not the followership, because if followership lets that happen, then they have not failed. Now, I'd like to tell you that Mr. Rebish and I began this war about 1988 to say that the currency option that was taking place was going to destroy the economy. And we said it'd be a thousand naira to the naira, uh, naira to the dollar then. It didn't agree. Now, I'll give you a history of how our prosperity was destroyed. The first one was the Dodger Award, which was done not related to productivity at all. The second was indigenization, where you're not prepared for industrial production. The third was a deregulation without a linkage to productivity or production linkages. The fourth was a currency sale in order to meet what is called the special drawing rights, which had absolutely no clue as to what was going on. We fought at that time with Abu Shogat as my chairman, and most people did not listen to what you're saying. So the key issue is for the elites in Nigeria to reach and enlighten themselves again, just like we're trying to do, to understand that the whole purpose of politics is a shared prosperity. Why is Ukraine fighting? Ukraine is fighting to share the prosperity of Western Europe. We have destroyed our prosperity, so there's nothing to share in West Africa. And no matter how much noise you make, we might be this perennial state of poverty, or we must stop blaming the followership. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are going to take uh, Mr. St Stephen Lawson and then so you can address, because I believe there was, there's just been one question from everyone so far. So we would have Mr. Stephen Lawson. Um, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Antijumi. Uh, General, uh, your presentation was uh, very insightful. As a matter of fact, for a lot of us, it is more of um, an historical tutorial that we are very glad to be abreast uh, with. And I agree with you, even though it might seem to be a little bit in the opposite with some of the submission here, that a majority of our issues actually lies with the followership. The followership itself is the crop from which the leadership obviously comes from even though we know that the box stops at the table of the leader. 
So perhaps you would like to share with us some insights, some ideas, recommendations um, for us to be able to gain and engage the followership within a time frame period, not in the immediacy, so that in the next five years or 10 years, the followership might be very much empowered to be able to determine the output of our political uh, um, 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 lives. And so if we understand that, perhaps we will be able to produce leaders that are going to be responsible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, my brother, for the, that powerful submission. So go ahead, sir, um, if you could address those four comments and then we'll take the last set and then yeah. I'll read some questions to you from the chat, sir. Okay, just um, let me take the last word. I've just promised to send a concept paper that I developed on the issue of followership to set up a laboratory for the study of followership in Nigeria and how they can be empowered. I did try your universities in various parts of Nigeria. They were not interested anyway, for one reason or the other. But church or any institution can set up that sort of lab. It's very simple. Now, so I will send you, I will send you a concept paper which can be shared to everybody. Let me start with ECOWAS. ECOWAS has, ECO has, has a charter, which was agreed to by every member of ECOWAS, including Mauritania. Mauritania has now left and joined the Northern Arab countries. But ECOWAS has a charter. Apart from that, ECOWAS has a protocol or convention for peace and security in West Africa. And they have a whole commissioner for political affairs, peace and security in the ECOWAS Secretariat there, who is in charge with some principal program officers and so on to implement this convention, agreed to by all members. Now, the social convention or governance system in West Africa, uh, governance system and democracy in, Af in West Africa, put together by ECOWAS, agreed to by all member states of ECOWAS and signed by the heads of state of ECOWAS. And it is within this convention that they have a playbook, like I said, which they used in responding to a situation like the coup. But what I'm trying to say is this. Over the last two and a half years, we have seen three coups before the Niger war. And they use that playbook and it's not working. As I'm saying, it's not working. Therefore, it requires that you need to look at that playbook again. And not only looking at it, but also have a flexible playbook in which you don't have to respond the same way that you responded in the past because situations have changed. And the boys who are doing pools now, they know the playbook so well. And Mali did show the helplessness of ECOWAS because each member state is sovereign. So there's a limit to what ECOWAS can do. ECOWAS is not a political federation or political confederation. It's not. The president of ECOWAS cannot tell a member state to do something they don't want to do. Any member state to do what he does not want to do. Can tell ECOWAS to go to hell, or it can even pull out. And Mali and Co did threaten to pull out. Okay, so and there's a limit to power and to anything that anybody in ECOWAS can do. That's a limit. And that's why I said, ECOWAS is as strong as the member states of ECOWAS and their willingness 
to do what is necessary. That, 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 that's the way it is. So they have all the documents that are necessary. They have them, they have them. But you have to be flexible in applying <laughs> those um, playbooks to go in line with the situation that you are faced with. And Equus has lost space with Mali, with Guinea. So coming up to threatening, it does not make any sense at all. Or you couldn't do that in Mali and uh, Burkina Faso. It means you have not learned any lessons at all, any lessons at all. And the advisors to our president too, they have a fault. They don't even think properly before they just started, you know, before they push papers to him to start saying what he said. Today now, he has turned down completely. And to my brother in Canada, when you have a situation in Africa <coughs> and you know that African military can really act to solve problems within their own territory, they have to depend on our side. And then you just come up and say, I'm going to invade another country because I want to destroy democracy there. And then one foreign country then comes up and say, if you do that, I will support you. And what are the people fighting for? You, you have just said to that, you support Francophone countries because they want to get rid of you no know, colonialist activities of, of France, especially in West Africa. And then for a president to say, we invade and they come up and say, yes, we support you. No. And France up to now, I've told you that they are not going anywhere. They are not going anywhere. France has told me that. But France is looking for a cover. And Nigeria should not provide France the cover. Because the same France never did anything in charge. They did not do anything in charge. They allow uh, Debison to take over the government. Now, when you come to Echo, no, sir, it is not the Francophone country that was not ready for ECHO. It was Nigeria. Nigeria was not ready for ECHO. Nigeria was not ready for ECHO. Francophone countries were ready for ECHO. In fact, they even agreed to change the CFR to ECHO. Ghana agreed to join the Francophone countries. Nigeria convinced Ghana and said, step back. So it's not the Francophone country at all. Secondly, too, the arrangement of the CFR has changed completely between Cote d'Ivoire and France. All this information are open. They're available. They're available. So the sort of situation where Francophone countries in West Africa were tied to the airport strings of France have gone completely. It has changed. It has changed over the last two years. It has changed. The information is open. So if anybody tells you that, now come into my name. About 10 years ago, ECA set up a mining center to advise African countries on how to negotiate contracts with all these foreign companies who are coming to Africa to, to do some mining. Okay. African Union has taken over this center now. Uh, that center now is not based in Conakry in Guinea. And African countries have been using the experts in that center to negotiate. If you look at the new contracts, many contracts in Africa today, they're totally different from the one you find about five, 10 years ago. Five, 10 years ago, they, they changed, big change. You, you know, big change altogether. So that's the point. And then there's one thing that people need to understand. In the case of uranium, France exports only 12% of the needs of uranium from Niger, 12%. Burkina Faso that's making noise has no uranium at all. They have nothing like uranium. Niger, yes, 12% of France. And France has a three-year reserve 
of uranium stock. Namibia is ready to supply them. Namibia is ready to supply them. So we, we need to be very clear about some of these issues, you know, before accusing France or anything. But the point I'm also making is this is that if we are not so weak, why do we need them? After 60 years of independence, there's something wrong with us. There's something surely that is wrong with us. So I think I have been able to, you know, answer some of the questions, some of the issues that have been raised. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. So we are going to take the last three sets of questions uh, from uh, Jose Omotosho and uh, Colonel um, Belo Fadili. And then the last person is Benjamin Umieze, Umieza. So please go ahead, uh, Mr. Omotosho, with your question. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is um, uh, Dr. Jose Omotosho. Uh, I'm a retired wing commander in Nigerian Air Force. And I want to thank you, Pastor Itua, for what you are doing. I pray that somehow, someday, uh, we will look back and thank you and everyone that is making the contribution. Um, General Williams, sir, I truly salute, sir. But my question, uh, my contribution first, is around the Sovereign National Conference um, to determine how to be governed. The problem is not the system of governance. The problem is not the military. The problem is not whether we, we have a civilian rule or not. I think the problem is righteousness, tied it up with justice. Um, the, and then uh, Professor also mentioned whether women should come on the scene. I think the problem is basically righteousness. How righteous are we when we get to the place of leadership? Uh, let me quote the Bible, which says, righteousness exhausts a nation. And if the righteous be a rule, people will rejoice. Nigerians are mourning. So that, is, that means things are bad. Nobody is considering them. How do we um, solve this problem? Well, is it followership or leadership? Uh, I, I think it's more with the leadership. I remember the days of war against discipline. And everybody was in shape. Everybody was queuing up. Everybody was picking pieces of paper on the road. So if it is a, 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 a leader who is aggressive, who wants to do what is right, and is backed by the judiciary that want to do something. Um, for example, I know the, the, the judiciary is very, very compromised in Nigeria. Uh, it used to be the last uh, hope of the common man, but it's not anymore. So my, my take is this. I think the Sovereign National Conference is very, very important. And I believe in Confederacy because, you know, Nigeria is just, it's not a, con it's a country, but it's not a nation. Nigeria is not a nation. And nations are, are bounded by culture, by, by language, by, you know, uh, common knowledge and things that bind them together. Nigeria is just a conglomeration of nations put together by Britain for, for business purposes. I think it's high time we come back to that. The decree 1999 that we're operating on is a military decree. It's decree four. It's not be with the people coming together. So let people go along their cultural ways and let them, let, let, let the regions develop and go back to where we were before. And the, you know, there are three basic nations in Nigeria and come up with the, with the cultural language. That's what I will advocate. And uh, now to the question, sir, do you think, do you still believe in an entity called Nigeria? And do you think Nigeria can survive another 10 years? Those are my two questions. Based on what we have been discussing, do you really have hope and believe in this country, the way things are going on? And do you think that Nigeria can survive for another 10 years? Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. So, Colonel, um, Colonel Belo Fadile, please go ahead with your question, sir. Yeah, good, good afternoon, sir. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Well, like you always say, hurry, hurry, the bus trouser. Um, I, I think you can confirm, or as you are aware, that the, the, before I ask my questions on the ECOWAS standby force, 
and then 21 man member of the Nigeria government. You are aware, sir, that without the support of the Nigerian Special Forces and the Chadian military, Nigeria couldn't have conducted the 2015 election where we were able to clear Boko Haram from the 15 local governments, even though Buhari government claimed they did, Jonathan government did. So Boko Haram is not Nigeria problem. And some minutes ago, the ECOWAS um, extraordinary minute came to a decision that the ECOWAS standby committee should get their forces ready immediately to restore order in Nigeria Republic, constitutional order in Nigeria, Nigeria Republic. Now the, the military junta, knowing that nothing has warrant or under the UN constitution or the use of force, there's no breakdown of law under in Nigeria, have considered a government of their own people. Where does ECOWAS stand by force and the joint task force and the, and the Nigerian government? Because the president is saying the problem in Nigeria is uh, this, uh, we, call, we have a destabilizing effect on Nigeria, forgetting where we are coming from. Where do we stand? Now you have ECOWAS standby force, you have the Nigerian force, you have the Nigerian force, you have the joint tax force. Where do we stand to maintain international peace and order under the UN constitution? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So we'll take the last question and then uh, so you could address all this. Please go ahead, Mr. Benjamin, ask your question. Okay, um, good evening, General. Um, just a quick, well, two quick questions. Um, firstly, I want to know why we tend to gravitate towards democracy as the sole problem to um, challenges um, facing African leadership or general global leadership. We've seen democracy Fail in um, many instances, and um, there are countries that are not practicing democracy and they are doing very well. So, why is it that we don't tend to actually maybe, um, okay, before the coming of the, um, the, um, the, the, the West, the West, um, the West to Africa, we had systems of governance. Um, we had traditional systems of governance that actually um, worked, the systems that were, they were, they were, um, the prosperous systems, we have them in history, great civilizations. So why don't we kind of maybe model our own system of leadership into what was previously existing before these guys came to introduce democracy as the silver bullet to all leadership challenges? Like we see Saudi Arabia, they don't practice democracy. We see UAE, they're not practicing democracy. Libya, we were doing very well under Gaddafi, apart from until when the West started with their own trouble. So why don't we actually um, come back, step aside, and um, and maybe look inwards at systems of governance that actually worked for us as Africans, uniquely African systems of governance, and actually practice those systems. Like we see in Rwanda that we're talking about, that's making Rwanda is doing well today. Rwanda is not a democracy, except we want to deceive ourselves that it's democracy. It's not a democracy, and they are doing very very well there. Um, why can't we come back and look inwards at systems of governance and ditch this maybe this democracy, we can keep it aside or model is to what fits us. Then secondly, um, I was reading something this morning and they're trying to tie the interference of the West. Um, um, okay, then trying to tie the interference of the West due to the, um, the Russian Ukraine war and the gas pipeline that's traveling from Nigeria to Europe. Um, is that just another um, controversy theory, or it, it actually has a linkage to this? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Um, go ahead, sir, with those last three sets of questions, and if you could also give us your closing remark. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Uh, about um, a sovereign national conference, in my own humble opinion, we do not need it. Because to me, since we are a multi-ethnic nation, I believe there's a system or governance that can keep us together. I've just mentioned the Swiss system, Switzerland based on the German, French, 
They have another language nobody understands in the world, and Italian. Those are the cantons in Switzerland. And that's what I'm saying. You don't even know the president of Switzerland or the council of ministers. So there's a system. Then you ask me, is there any one in Africa? Yes. Tanzania has the former Zanzibar. Many people do not know that. Zanzibar is still there. And Tanzania is a confederation. What is the arrangement? Zanzibar has a president, not vice president, a president. And in the Tanzania constitution, Zanzibar also produces the vice president for the whole of Tanzania. And now recently, the president from the majority Tanzanian died. The lady from Tanzania, who was the vice president is now the president. But Zanzibar still has a president. That is the sort of confederal system that can be done in Nigeria. And like I said, every fire report went into that. So what is the need of a national conference when you could usually adopt that? To me, there's no need at all. There's no need at all. Look at every fire report. Do the confederate system, and then everything will be all right. Now, what may happen is this is that you cannot blame the federal government if you are not developing. You don't need to force the state to be part of any zone. Let the state form part of the confederate body. If states decide that they want to form a zone, that is their problem. If you look at Southwest now, in business and industry, or do a group of companies, is doing a fantastic job now in the Southwest. Other states in other zones can do the same thing. So there are examples all over the place that we can use instead of all the national. I remember when they did one under uh, Jonathan. Each person in the national conference got 12 million naira. 12 million naira, each person. And what did they do with the report? The same thing with the upper center world. We don't need it. We don't need it. That's my own uh, humble opinion. Now about Melo um, Padilla <laughs> and his joint tax force and all those things, and so on and so forth. Again, those ones cannot exist without the support. You'll be surprised to note that France helps with intelligence. <laughs> For those units, France, they come all the way from France to, to come and be gathering information. For our own people in that area to use. This is why I'm saying that we need to sit down really, seriously, except the military, to sit down and say, hey, this has to stop. We need to take responsibility for ourselves and find out the way out. Interestingly, the president went to Amphosis Staff College in Dad and read that speech. No president in Nigeria has ever read that speech. What did he say? That the Amphosis needs to look at its organization, its operation, strategy, and tactics. No president has ever said that, even in a military president. Now, he has made that speech. What is he doing about it? What is he doing about it? Is he getting the military boss to act? Because he has accepted there is a need to reorganize the military itself. That's the problem about Africa, you know? President will go and talk. If in a developed world, a president goes out to make that tough statement, these are going to change because those are policy statements and they must change. Okay, so it depends on who is going to make the Minister of Defense and the Minister of Internal Security in Nigeria, which is for some, something ministers that, that he, he has appointed. So about uh, the Tambay Brigade, 
where will the money to run the standby force come from? They've asked each country to designate a battalion to be used. But anytime you ask African countries to do something, the next question is you go to pay for it. Who is going to pay for it? And the joint task force, in most cases, Nigeria was bearing the brunt. Nigeria was bearing the brunt. Okay, and of course, France, UK, United States. Always, if we don't sit down, like I said, to look at all these issues, we are not going to get anywhere. So to me, the joint task force, the Tabai Brigade, because if you have Tabai Brigade active, what do you need a joint task force for? You don't need it. Tamba Brigade should have taken the responsibility to be able to do that. If you go far away from Nigeria and you go to Sudan, two, two stupid generals are fighting each other. And all Africans are looking at them. It's Saudi Arabia and United States that they are trying to help to solve the problem. You see how weak we are? As if we have no strategic thinkers in Africa. It's a very sad story. I feel very sad in my knowledge that we have descended to that level. So I, I believe that uh, with respect to Niger, what should happen is this is that, a pastor too has said, give them time. Now that everybody has accepted that, you can't set, send an invading force to, to Niger, what you should try to get them to do is to be an example to Mali, Guinea and Burkina Faso. And tell them that your predecessor stayed there for only one month in 2010, 2011, one, one year. And they handed over government. And none of them contested any election. So can you live up to that standard in order for you to be an example to Mali? Because Mali has already put in their constitution. We are waiting for a referendum to approve. And in that constitution, the soldiers can contest. But in the case of Niger in 2011, no, the soldiers stopped themselves from contesting in the new constitution. And with, it, with also too, there's also always, always a playbook that uh, whenever there is transition, you must write a new constitution. They don't need to write a new constitution. They don't need to write a new constitution, not at all. There's nothing bad with the present one. Not at all that with the president. So what they need to do is to convince the military boys there and say, okay, stay there for one year. All of you, amnesty, get your pension and everything, and just stay quietly. Because those who did the coup in 2010, they are all staying in the year. They are there. They are there, including the people who was the former head of state, military head of state, a gentleman to the call, that man. Okay, so <laughs> this what I can say because uh, the outcome of the meeting in Abuja is um, I now accepted that they must go through quite diplomacy to get what they want and let them discuss and be able to do that. But the president of Guinea Bissau, who was the former president of uh, chairman of ECOWAS before Bonatinubu, that one is pushing because he has a problem in his country. That's a problem. And Nigerian troops are in Guinea-Bissau to prevent a coup. If not, you could have gone a long time ago, even though it was a former general too. But Nigerian troops are there. Troops are still there in Gambia. So the, problem, the issue is this is that when you go to any country, you know when you go in, you don't know when you are going to get out. You don't know when you are going to get out. That is why in DRC, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, UN has been there for over 60 years, and there's no way out with all the violence that's going on in DRC. With all the violence that's going on in DRC, there's no way out. And the Nigerian too, coming back to Niger, they cannot solve the problem of the jihadists without help. Mali told everybody to go. They brought in work now. They've not solved the problem. Burkina Faso, half of Burkina Faso have been occupied by the jihadists. I will repeat, 
we need to sit down as Africans and say, hey, what do we do without these people? And then even if you are going to ask them for help, we will now decide that we must take some responsibility for ourselves and decide very clearly what sort of help we need from them and over what period of time. I will end on that. Thank you so much for listening to me. Um, thank you so much. Pastor Sonny, are you? You're... Yeah, um, thank you very much, General. We are very grateful for your very insightful and um, insightful um, comments on the issues at ground. And on the issue on ground, at least we know that um, we have a lot of experience, information um, that we have brought to bear. And we want to thank everyone that came on the platform this evening. I hope we are better enlightened. And um, in general, we really appreciate the fact that you are going to send us your position paper. And we we'll probably, you know, at your age, you are probably not. Um, but we'll try to work with you to see how to work with whatever paper you send to us. We promise to look at it because this is what we are all about in ALG. And we want to thank everyone that have come on the platform today. My name is Sonny Emili, who hosts from this program. And we have a pastor I want to say have a very good evening. And over to Jim Okemi, we will have one or two announcements before we leave the platform. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. And I also want to th thank uh, Major General for taking the time to really go walk us through um, the history uh, and a lot of information that some of us may not have been privy to. And there are a couple of takeaways that I just want us to emphasize on here at ALG, which is the followership. And he talked about... Um, the African problem is not leadership, but followership. And that's part of what we're trying to do here, really build um, a set of engaged citizens that have the information that they need to actively engage in nation building. And we launched the CRC course um, on August 1st and it has six modules. Interesting enough, I did post a couple of slides from module one, we talked about citizens' responsibility. So we encourage everyone to continue to be engaged in this conversation. That's part of what we are doing here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Uh, West African time, we meet, we bring thought leaders to speak on issue, and then we're better informed uh, for us to be able to hold our leaders accountable and also to um, elect the right leaders for our nations, for the, the, the progress and advancement of our nation. So thank you so much. We posted a link. If this is your first time here, we're glad you were able to join us. Please go ahead and complete that form that we put in the group, in the chat room, uh, where we'll be able to get your information and then send you more information on what we're doing here at Africa Leadership Group. Thank you. Over back to you, Pastor Sonny. I think this, that's it. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate you. Thank you very much, uh, Major General. We appreciate your time with us. Thank you all. Thank you. Can I say good evening to the General, Mrs. Adetola. General Williams, I think he has gone. I think may, we may, yeah, he may have dropped off. Yes, he did yeah. spend quite a number of time with us. Yes. We used so to work still together. On. He's still on. Um, he, Major okay. General is still on. You see this there? He's ah, still General, here. Thank you. Mrs. Adetula, say hello to you. You can't see my face. <laughs> anyway, good night. Thank you, every, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye. Same time, same Zoom Bye. link next week. Please share the information. The more we informed we are, um, the more engaged we can be to really affect the changes that we need. Thank you. Have a good night. God bless you. God bless you too.